Fred Collier joined the Army in World War II and was adept at medical things, so he was put into the medical corps and eventually they sent him off to study to be a doctor. And then 1945 came and the war was over. Thanks be to God. But the problem back then is there were no GI bills. You couldn't get loans if you were a poor boy. How was he going to finish his education to be a doctor? So getting out of the army, he goes to a barber shop and he sees some magazines while he's waiting to get his hair cut and he opens up one of the magazines and it's a story about the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, and her many, many charitable organizations that she supported. And he decided, well, I'm going to write her. I'm going to write the president's wife. Actually, President Franklin Roosevelt had just died a few months earlier. And so it is now the president's widow that he writes. His girlfriend said, oh, that'll never work. But he does it anyway. He writes the letter, and some time later, he gets a response. And Mrs. Roosevelt wants to meet him. So he has an appointment to meet with Mrs. Roosevelt. He tells his story, and she said, I'll find the support. And sure enough, through various charities, got him through medical school. Well, when he graduated and became Dr. Fred Collier, of course, he invited her to the graduation, and he said to her, I simply don't know how to thank you for what you've done for me. And this is what Mrs. Roosevelt said to him. I will be adequately, adequately repaid if when you are financially secure someday, you help out someone else who is truly deserving as you were. Now that's a long time ago. Before we had the expression, pay it forward, but that's exactly what was happening. She blessed this young man who came to her as a beggar. He had no money. And she gave him this gift so that he might be able to be a gift to others. Look at Bartimaeus in the gospel today, the blind beggar. When Jesus is coming through the city of Jericho, which, by the way, should remind you of the arrival of the Israelites in the Holy Land, because when Moses made it to the Jordan River, he died there on the hills of Moab, the country we call today Jordan, overlooking the Jordan River and the Promised Land. And he was to send someone else to lead the Israelites. And that man was named Joshua. Yeshua in Hebrew. Which, by the way, is Jesus' name. Yeshua. Right? Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua. And Joshua means God saves. So here's the first town fortified, the most ancient oasis city along the Jordan. And it took the Israelites quite a while to surround it, overcome it, and Jericho represented the opposition to God's people. Okay, now Jesus is there. By the way, this is the end of his public ministry. This is it. It's over. It's his last stop. He's on his way to Jerusalem to be killed. Okay? This is it. All the rest of the teaching in Mark's gospel is done. Now he's at Jericho. Think about what that represents. The people who rejected God's plan. And there's one man there, a blind beggar. Bartimaeus shouts, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And what do the apostles do? Shh, be quiet. They're trying to get rid of it. Shh, be quiet. Go away. Don't bother the master. We've got an important mission right now. We're going to Jerusalem. Get out of the way. He cries out even louder, Jesus, son of David. Eleison is the Greek word in the original. Yeah, Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. That's what he's saying. And Jesus tells the apostles, bring him over. Have him come to me. Now they change their tune, right? 180 degrees, these goombas 
finally say, okay, come on, come on, Jesus wants to see you. So they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus so thoughtfully, lovingly says to him, what would you have me do for you? Jesus is about to be taken to his execution. And he's now concerned about this blind beggar. And he says, well, I want to see. And Jesus gives him his sight. And then he simply follows the master. You see, this blind man had better vision than all these other people around him. He was the one that realized he is the descendant of King David. He's the one we've been waiting for. And he's going to have mercy on me. Can we see with eyes of faith? The blind man saw better than the apostles. Reminds me of a, a greeting in South Africa in the Zulu language. You are greeted by this word, Sabuhana. They don't say hello, hi, good morning. They say Sabuhana. You know what it means? I see you. That's how they greet each other. They look at each other in the eye and say, I see you. When you got up this morning, Jesus said, I see you. Did you hear him? Did you say, Lord, I want to see. Many years ago, a parishioner gave me a painting of this very scene, and I have it in my room, of the blind man reaching out to Jesus with his hand, and I think about saying, Lord, I am the blind man. Help me to see what you would have me see. Give me your vision. Oh yeah, I have natural sight. But I want Jesus' vision. Do you ever ask Jesus, Lord, help me to see what you want me to do? What you would have me do? Reminds me in this first reading from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, unfortunately, if you read his book, is full of gloom and doom because Israel had disobeyed the law and they had abandoned God. They were now prisoners, right? In the captivity. But in the middle of his text, there in the 31st chapter, we hear a prophecy of hope. And if you go to the end of chapter 31, from which we hear today, there is something that is seen nowhere else in the Old Covenant, nowhere else in the Bible, until we get to the New Covenant. Let's see if you can figure it out. The prophet says, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. God's law upon the heart. Nowhere else in the Bible do we hear about a new covenant except in Jeremiah. And then Jesus comes and he gives us a new covenant in his blood. You see the hope there? That we would make a covenant relationship with God. And Jesus is that new covenant. It is personal, right? It is an intimate relationship that Jesus calls us to. Do we have the vision to see it? I pray very often for a divine illumination of souls so that we might all see what God would have us see. Illumine our souls, Lord, so that we might do what you would have us do. Remember the story of a woman born in 1820 by the name of Fanny Crosby. When she was a little girl, six weeks old, I believe, they discovered she had some trouble with her eyes. She wasn't seeing, and they gave her various treatments, and tragically, she went blind from the treatments never saw again. She lived to be 95. And this Fanny Crosby could see better than you and I can the grace of God. And she wrote poetry and hymns in response 
to that inner vision. She wrote 8,000 hymns in her lifetime. She was a real star of the 19th century. Died in 1915 and one of her most famous songs, hymns that she wrote, is called Blessed Assurance. About the assurance, the confidence that we have in faith. And these are the lyrics of that hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, and washed in his blood. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Notice she said, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. This is a blind woman who sees better than I can the vision of heaven, the invisible world, the blessed assurance of God's grace and mercy. You know, this month we celebrated St. Teresa of Avila on her feast day, October 15th. And Teresa, who had the vision of heaven, right, the mystical Teresa, spoke about this in a poem about the body. Now Paul, St. Paul, talks about this mystical body into which we are incorporated. Just yesterday, we had the members of our RCIA, those catechumens and candidates who are going to be received at Easter into the sacraments, they were welcomed into the church officially and you could see the enthusiasm that they have, which maybe you and I take for granted because we're, we can see, we see it all, right? Because we've been given it since our baptism, but we've taken it for granted. They see with an enthusiasm, with a zeal, what the grace of God can do for their hearts. Well, just like those who are just confirmed over this weekend, we had some adults in the adult confirmations. They have that new zeal. St. Teresa puts it this way. She says, Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, the feet, the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. And so we ask for the vision, the illumination, to see what Jesus would have us see, to see the needs that are there that we've missed. Maybe our vision has been myopic and we can't see beyond our nose because it's all about me instead of all about thee. The Word made flesh who is the light of the world. Jesus, grant that we might see. Amen.